Hear now this story from the Gospel according to John. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. For the word of God in Scripture for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. So Michael and I were married on June the 6th, 2009 in Oklahoma City in in a city park just a few blocks down from our house in this spot where there was kind of a little hill down beside the creek and it leveled out just at the creek and all these great old trees had grown around it and kind of sheltered it and We'd arranged the 200 white chairs in there, and it looked really pretty before all the guests came. And, and then, you know, the guests all started arriving, all our friends and family and church members. And, and Michael and I waited back at the house and, and came last, even after we'd sent all the wedding party down. And we arrived in one of my church members' uh, bright red classic Thunderbird convertible. And he had the parade bench you know, seat that was on the back. So we were like the grand marshals of the parade, you know, sitting up on, and we had not even told our family or wedding party how we were going to arrive. So it was a great, you know, splash of excitement when we came pulling up in this great bright red uh, Thunderbird. And and then we came down and got everybody organized and, and down the aisle. And we got up there to the front, standing there by our minister and all of our friends around us and our family. And, and, It was in that moment that I really realized what was making this moment sacred was their presence. That, you know, I could make this commitment or this vow, you know, individually, but that I was doing it in front of all these people. They would be witnesses to this moment and to our joy and happiness and would be, they would be able to tell me that story myself again in the future if I ever needed to hear it. And then from there, we went back to the reception at our house. We had spent months preparing the lawn, getting everything ready. We had tables all up and decorations and lights and lanterns hanging. And, and then Michael is half Filipino. And so part of, part of Filipino tradition is that you have to have a lot of food. And you have to have so much food that people have some to take home with them. And part of Filipino tradition is a roast pig. So my mother-in-law, Nympha, had ordered two roast pigs for the wedding, and one was already butchered and out in the chafing dishes for serve, and the other one was sitting in the middle of the table. Uh, You know, just like some medieval feast or something. We didn't have an apple in the mouth, we had a sunflower, because that was one of the flowers we were using. So I think all of our vegetarian friends were quite horrified when they walked into the room. (laughs) And so everybody had served themselves, and before people started leaving, my mother-in-law, while she's still in her mother-of-the-groom dress, gets in there and starts butchering the, the pig that was on the table, and she had big Ziploc baggies, and she was filling them so people could take it home with them, because this, this is tradition, and this is hospitality, and she was so good at the use of that knife that I know never to make her angry. <laughs> And it was just this amazing moment and this sense of celebration and joy and hospitality. And so there is a reason why weddings have such symbolism in the biblical story. And I'm sure all of you could, if you've got married, you could share stories of how exciting your wedding day was. Or even if you've been to someone else's wedding, a friend or a loved one, weddings 
are memorable. They're some of the best parties we go to. The decorations are great, the food is great, the drinks are great, you can have music and dancing, and it can be just a great time. And we remember them, they are important in the stories of our families, in our own stories, in our community as a, as a church. And so this is one of the ways in which we still actually have a connection with our ancient sisters and brothers. This is one of the things we still have in common. Because for them, weddings were big, grand, wonderful events in their lives. In lives that were often very mundane, uh, maybe even dreary, a wedding could be an opportunity for some abundance and feasting and joy that might not be there every day of their lives. And so, it's understandable that the wedding would then become a symbol for the abundant blessings of God. And so it has that meaning throughout the Judeo-Christian tradition. And we think about um, various texts that refer to weddings. But it also took on an extra meaning, not only of God's blessing and abundance, but of God's hopes and dreams for humanity and for the creation. In the book of Revelation, there is the wedding feast of the Lamb. At the end of time, God is throwing a party and all of creation are invited. And the best image that the gospel of the writer of the book of Revelation had to draw on was the idea of a wedding feast, that God's dream for the, all of the universe is a big wedding party. Part of what God intends for us, God hopes for us, is joy and celebration. So all of that is a part of the context here in which Jesus performs this first sign. Of course, this is just a normal wedding, a village wedding that he and his mother have been invited to, but yet the context tells us that we're connecting up to all of these other grand themes and images of God's blessing and God's hopes. And at this wedding, Jesus performs the first of his signs. In the Gospel of John, the miracles of Jesus are referred to as signs, and which is a different way of talking about them than the other Gospels speak about them. And part of what is intended here is that the signs serve this particular purpose. They aren't just wonders or miracles or flashy sort of things. They serve a purpose in the Gospel of John. And part of that purpose is based on the story that we looked at last week. These would-be disciples come to Jesus and he says to them, what are you looking for? And then he tells them to come and see. And part of what I, and then a little later he says, and you'll see things even greater than this. And part of what I said last week is that when Jesus calls these would-be disciples to come and be a part of his movement, he's inviting them to come and get to know him and to build a relationship and to keep their eyes open and to watch and observe and then to use their own judgment, their own intuition, to respond to what they see. And he is confident that what they will see is something that will compel them to want to be a part of his movement, something that will compel them to join up, that once they see, they will believe. And so then immediately we come into this story. So the signs in the Gospel of John are those things that once the disciples see, they believe. They then want to be a part of what Jesus is doing. Now, it could be that they're just drawn to the magic of this water turning into wine, but I think it's more than that. I think that the author of this story is trying to convey some deeper spiritual meanings about what God intends and God wants. And so one thing to draw on is this very idea of the image of wine. Why would wine be significant? Well, there's lots of places in Scripture where wine is, and the vineyard is used to symbol, symbolize the blessings of God. And one in particular is in Isaiah 25, beginning in verse 6. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food filled with marrow of well-aged wines strained clear. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. 
We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So for those who had grown up hearing these sorts of stories, when they see Jesus provide this abundance of good wine, it immediately resonates. Not just that this is wine, but this is the sort of thing that God does. This is a divine act. Jesus is an agent of God, bringing about God's purposes. And so they would have connected with that. They would have seen that. They would have gained insight into who Jesus was and what he was doing. But it was even more so than just the abundance of wine. It connects with an even deeper story in the life of the people. So, and, I, and that I learned a little bit about this week. This week was the Winter Convocation, an event every year that the United Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ hold for our clergy here in Nebraska and go to a fellowship with each other, have a little retreat, learn a little bit from each other. Bill Switzer and I sat next to each other and made interesting comments about people all throughout the presentation. <laughs> the, um, but the presentation was by Dr. Richard Lowry, who's an esteemed uh, Old Testament scholar, and he was talking about Genesis and human rights and reading the book of Genesis through the lens of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, and he was talking about all these passages that are so familiar, and one of which was the, the creation story. And he, and he talked about something I did know about, that, you know, that the Hebrew creation story is in many ways fashioned on and, and a development of and a reconfiguration of the Babylonian creation story as recorded in the Babylonian epic, the Enuma Elish. But he pointed out a few things I hadn't learned before. And one is that at the end of the Babylonian creation story, after the god Marduk has killed Tiamat the ocean and split her body into two to create the heavens and the earth, Marduk creates human beings. But Marduk creates them in order to be slaves serving the gods. And part of what these human slaves are supposed to do is to prepare food and drink for the gods because the gods don't want to have to do this for themselves anymore. And instead, they want to sit back in heaven and rest. Now then, you get to the Genesis story and it turns all of that on its head. Because at the end of the Genesis story, God creates human beings and gives them dominion. In the Hebrew story, God creates humans not as slaves and servants, but to rule. And God then promises that God will provide the abundance from the creation. That, that, that the nourishment that humans need will be present and God will provide it and God commands them to rest. Yes, God rests, but God commands humans to rest as well. So all of this image from the Babylonian story gets turned on its head in the Hebrew story. And even in our primary text, our first text, we get this sense of what God dreams and wants for humanity. God wants us to enjoy the life that we have been given, to celebrate it, to take time to rest and have leisure, and God will provide the abundance we need. And I think that's part of what's also happening in this story. The reason they recognize that Jesus is a divine agent is that he's doing what God promised to do, which is to provide sustenance and nourishment and abundance for God's people. And there's one other key element of this story, and that is the jars. The jars being used are, the are used in the purification rituals of the, of the Hebrew people. And it is these that God uses to make the great wine that everyone's going to get drunk on. Now, in the Hebrew tradition, there are multiple different strands different groups of people within the Hebrew people who thought differently about God. And, and I, it's important that we understand that because so often 
in the history of the Christian church, when we read the New Testament and we read its criticisms of Pharisees and scribes and various, it has led to anti-Semitic interpretation. And part of what we have to understand is that these were internal conversations within the, the, the Jewish people and different ways in which they were interpreting their traditions. And so these criticisms are not criticisms of all Jews, but criticisms of certain ways of looking at things. So with that caveat, in the, one of the traditions is the priestly tradition. And a great side of the priestly tradition is they wrote that Genesis creation story. So they've got this great side, but there's also a kind of downside to the priestly tradition because they're also very concerned about rules and order. They wrote the book of Leviticus, for instance, which I'm sure not many of us find great devotional or spiritual content in. Leviticus is full of all these rules that divide people and separate them from one another. And there are all these cleanliness rituals and all these purification rituals that one has to go through. And so an example is in the book of Leviticus, it says that eunuchs are not allowed into the temple. They cannot come to worship God because they are unnatural and unclean. A different tradition within ancient Judaism is the prophetic tradition, which wants to break down all of these rules and rituals and dividing lines and believes in a much more universal will of God. And so in the prophet Isaiah, we get a text that says eunuchs will be welcomed into the house of God and given a special place. So you have these conversation going on in Judaism about different ways to approach God. And so part of what Jesus is doing here is taking a position in this conversation that God in his desire and God's desire for us to enjoy and celebrate life is not concerned about the rules and rituals and obedience of the purity code. God is not interested in dividing people and creating these exclusionary rules. God will turn those into vessels of joy and pleasure and celebration. Because God's hope for us, God's dream for us, is to enjoy life. And so the reason we get to the end of the story and it says the disciples saw Jesus' glory and believed is not because some great magic occurred, but because they saw in him what they had been looking for. They saw in him God's life-giving purposes. And they knew that this is someone who in what he teaches and in what he is doing is fulfilling God's deepest dreams for us. And they believed. They joined up. They wanted to participate because they wanted to be a part of this exciting celebration. And so the author of this story tells us this because he wants us to come and see and to decide for ourselves. He wants us to encounter the joys and blessings of God and us to want to join up. He wants us to believe in the name of Jesus and to believe in the God that Jesus is talking about. A God who loves us so much that God doesn't want our slavish obedience, but our enjoyment this is a glorious, life-affirming, life-giving, saving word.